Sure. Hi, my name is Renee Hobbs, and welcome to COM416. Uh, today's date is, oh my God, it's February 21st already. We are steaming through the spring 2018 semester with the students at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. You can see here that tonight we have Jordan, I see Monica, Peyton, Olivia, and Matt. Thank you so much for, for, for joining me tonight. Um, so let's take a look at what's on our agenda for today. We have just one hour and like a lot of things to talk about. Um, so here we are at the um, propaganda. It, actually, I bought the propaganda 2018 domain, but it somehow just keeps reverting me back to this one. So propaganda2018.com takes you here. And our topic today is unexpected consequences. We've been reading um, Ryan Holiday's classic book, um, Trust Me, I'm Lying. And um, really, it's been a fascinating thing to um, notice how you are learning in this class. So uh, let's start right at the top here. Um, it looks like at least six of you did come for the Zoom synchronous meeting. That is absolutely awesome. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what I noticed this wow. week. Um, about the work because um, right after this class, you'll be getting an email from me, and that email has a uh, personal, <laughs> a personal, a personal letter about your leap one, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. Uh, um, which I really enjoyed reading this week. Um, and so, if by any chance you don't get an email from me by tomorrow about your leap one, you know, ping me on Twitter, that's a good way to reach me, or by email. So I think I've read all of your uh, leap ones and made some comments. I want to uh, make some general comments about what I liked about these leap ones and then some challenges that I observed that were kind of common to a lot of students. Um, of course, one of the best things about uh, the leap ones was the really the great variety of um, examples that you generated and of course what's really beautiful is that it's very clear in this class because we are using the practices of digital learning that you are getting the chance to teach other people and other people are getting the chance to learn from you. I like to say that in digital learning, everybody learns from everybody. And so I was really pleased to see your good tweets that tried to capture what you learned from your peers, right? It was really clear that some of the examples that people shared, you found really engaging. Some of the ideas that people brought up were new to you and you got a chance to learn from them. You know, a lot of people say that they think in college it's really all about, from, about learning from your professors, but I don't think that's really true. And it's certainly not true the further along you go in your education, right? That really learning in a learning community, everybody learns from everybody. And that's why Jordan and I were talking about how really, since learning is a social activity, having time for social interaction like here on the Zoom is kind of a good thing. So I was really pleased to see how, how you helped people think about their own work by showing them that you learned from them. So thanks for that great feedback. That was a real, real pleasure to see. Was really proud of that. Um, in general, I loved the examples that you used. In general, I thought that the uh, level of writing style and the writing quality in the organization was fine. In general, I found that you struggled sometimes to demonstrate that your examples were propaganda by not always connecting back to the readings about the definitions of propaganda and the specialized vocabulary we're learning like disinformation, sponsored content and other things. So I felt there, I, I hope to see a little bit better effort in your ability to make connections, right? Between what you're experiencing in your life and then what we're reading about. That ideally that reading should help ratchet up the quality of your thinking, right? So I'd like to see, I'd like to see more of that when we move into our second leap. Um, 
So, but in general, that reflects kind of the basic pattern of feedback that I observe. Let me turn to my next topic, which is, are you watching? YouTube beta says no. <laughs> So I'm really glad that there are five of you on the Zoom tonight, but that means that 20 of you are not on the Zoom. And that means that you're obliged to watch the recording, which is not the funnest way to experience this class, but it has to be done. And one of the things that's gonna get more and more noticeable is that if you're not watching the uh, YouTube recording, then you're kind of missing a lot of like what the learning is. And that's gonna show up in your quizzes, that's gonna show up in your, in your work, and it's gonna just be a big snowball that gets worse and worse and worse. Um, the data that I have, it's astonishing, you know? I know exactly when you stopped watching, <laughs> exactly. Right? I have the IP address, I have how many minutes you watched, and I have when you didn't when you stopped watching. Wait, so, stop watching what? So if you're if you didn't participate live in the oh. live class, you are obliged to watch the recording. Right? Olivia, that hasn't been relevant to you because you've been showing up really regularly to the Zooms all the time, right? Yes. Yeah, you have. I noticed that. Um, but if you haven't, I also know who's watching the videos and who's not, and most of you are not watching the videos, and that's, I'm suggesting that's gonna be a problem as we move on for how you're understanding the ideas of the course. So to that end, um, I, I do think we should investigate the idea that maybe there's a better time for us to have our one hour once a week. You know, you can, I mean, who's in their bedroom right now? Right, you can do this anyway. Do you know that there's a Zoom? There's a Zoom app. You can do. You shouldn't do this while you're driving. Okay, don't don't participate in the class when you're driving a car. That's not good, right? But if you're a passenger in the car, you can do this while you're driving, right? So the Zoom app makes it easy to use this technology on your cell phone. Right? So I would like you to indicate alternative dates when you might be available. You simply click here. It goes to a doodle poll. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever used a poll tool like this before to schedule a meeting. Have you ever used a poll tool like this, a digital poll to schedule a meeting? If you have, give me a thumbs up there. Okay, so this is a really common tool in the professional world. We're trying to get people to have a meeting. When should we do it? So what you do is uh, you indicate, I've already indicated when I'm available. We try to, we're gonna try to find a better time. It may be that Wednesday at 4 p.m. is the best time, but looks like there might be other good times as, as well, all right? Wait, where can we find this on poll on the website? Yep, I'm just, I just, uh, uh, can, give me a thumbs up if you can actually see the uh, screen that I'm sharing with you right now. Good show. Yeah, so it's right here where it says, Alternate dates for Zoom class. Click here to indicate your availability. Really, really great. Um, okay, so now let me talk a little bit about what I'm noticing about your great Flipgrid responses. Um, just really terrifically, and I really hope that you will watch these all. I would bet that watching these Flipgrids could be very helpful for your quiz number two, uh, which is coming up. Uh, Michaela, really great. Uh, really great starting us off with chapters 13, uh, 13 through 15 um, around the idea of thumbnail cheating and the idea that a lot of people don't recognize satire and so misinformation uh, can happen online because people don't recognize it came from the onion or whatever. Um, Matthew chapter 13 through 15 uh, you tell you retell the story that uh, Ryan Holiday tells us about the nail polish fake news one of the things that's really important to realize is that Ryan Holiday wrote this book in 2010. That was eight years ago, okay? So long before any of us were talking about this big problem of fake news, he, he had it on his radar screen. He was noticing it. He was seeing the, the real dangers, which actually led him out of the PR business, right? So, uh, Matthew, your retelling of the nail polish story and the and the Shirley Sherrod story are absolutely classic. In fact, the Shirley Sherrod story, uh, the Department of Agriculture secretary uh, who was uh, whose video was manipulated. 
uh, by Breitbart, right, to uh, create, to make her look racist, to make her look racist, when in fact she was the opposite of racist. Um, that powerful example was the first time I heard about <laughs> Breitbart, right? And so now, we, of course, we, we've heard about it a lot, uh, heard about him and, and what he's created a, a lot, but that, that was a great example to use. So Matthew, thank you for that. Um, chapter 16 through 18. Um, Patrick, Patrick, you tell the American Apparel story about um, uh, the fake news story about uh, appearance discrimination. And you show how Gawker published it and then CNN ran with it and never bothered to check whether it was true. Um, and and um, you talked about that as Ryan Holiday calls it iterative journalism, right? Publish something quickly and then fix it fix the inaccuracies later on. And a lot of people in the journalism world under the pressure of a competition fell, uh, fell prey to that belief. And maybe that's partly why we're in the mess we're in right now, right? That phenomenon of uh, put out false news now, put out rumors, put out suspicions, and then correct as you go along. The research, as Ryan Holiday shows us, is that people never see the correction, and so the misinformation spreads. Um, Nick, Nick, really good effort there to try to explain the link economy. That's something I think everybody in the room should go back and make sure you can define the link economy, that you understand the link economy, and you understand how Ryan Holiday is explaining the, how the link economy contributed to a building a culture of fear. Um, and that's especially relevant for those of you who are public relations managers. Now, Ryan Holiday doesn't use well, he doesn't really quite use the word blackmail in chapter 16 to 18, but we're from Rhode Island. So we can use the term, right? Because like the Providence Mafia, I mean, we are legendary in the mafia world for the Providence Mafia. And blackmail is of course the classic money-making technique of the slime ball, right? You threaten somebody. And Ryan Holiday gives all these interesting examples of how slimy bloggers would threaten companies in ways that would create a situation that would force their force their um, crisis their crisis communication team to go crazy. Uh, so Nick, I was really pleased about that work. Caitlin, chapters nineteen through twenty one. Um, this is the first time he really, uh, Holiday really talks about the degradation sh ceremony. He talks about how much pleasure we take in, um, he shows how much pleasure we take in, um, in bringing someone down, right? In humiliating someone, in taking a, a hero and making them a villain. Um, and everyone who read that chapter talked about how powerful his writing was about Monica Lewinsky, right? That is really an important uh, way for us to understand the consequences of this online, this hyper, uh, hyper mediated um, world that we live in now. Um, Olivia. Olivia, you also talked about Lewinsky. Uh, you also talked about snark. And you talked about the idea that you can trivialize an idea, you can take someone down just by making fun of it, right? And that it, making fun of it also takes away your social responsibility for the damage you might do. And that was a really important point. Um, um, Olivia, you also talked about the funnel, the way in which the media is in fact a funnel that's selecting out messages. Uh, and that I th think was a really important point here in, in Holiday's book. Uh, Roe, chapters 22 to, to 24, uh, you talk about the WikiLeaks case. Uh, you talk about this very strange way in which uh, with digital media, we can speak reality, we can speak something into reality. I thought that was a very good turn of phrase. The power of our language to create an unreal reality. Mm. Ryan Holiday knows how dangerous that is. Um, and, and I guess in some ways, we're starting to understand that now, right? Um, Peyton, um, smear campaign, uh, tear people down in order to make money. 
um, and the incentives that are there for creating unreality, sort of the financial business part of why creating unreal realities is a, is a, a business model. Um, and then chapters 22 and 24, Julia, uh, more about smear campaigns and more about people's distorting information to grab attention. So clearly in this course, we're starting to understand that the most valuable commodity in the information landscape is human attention. And the easiest way to grab human attention is to, let's just review the four propaganda techniques that we know and love, evoke strong emotion, simplify ideas, appeal to people's needs and values, and attack opponents. That, that's the way to do it if you wanna grab attention. So um, I was starting to wonder about how you think Ryan Holiday might react to, uh, well, what's going on in the news lately, that Florida shooting. If you were to guess, based on your reading of part two, how do you think he would be, what, what would he be noticing or thinking or saying about this Florida shooting? Who wants to go first? I guess I will. Um, from what I read, I feel like he would tell you that like, what I read, he talked about how the truth is distorted and how it's hard to tell real news from fake news and how people often like, they'll, they want to be the first ones to report the news. So they'll send it out even if it's not true or if they don't, you know what I mean? If they don't know the facts are 100% correct, but um, as long as they get it out first, get people to see the news then that benefits them. So he would probably think during during the time of the shooting when people were sending out information, he probably would tell you to be careful to wait and see what's real and fake. Yeah. And really good point to underline that idea that uh, Holiday told us being fast was gonna be, was gonna take over being accurate, right? And so there would be a lot of pressure for people to be, to get their messages out fast, even if they weren't very good quality or even if they were inaccurate. Good way to start us off. Who's next? How would Ryan Holiday be reacting? I think he would say something about, um, I think he would say something about how the articles, oh sorry, there's a really quick lag, so it's like, um, articles showing video of people in the classroom actually hiding from the shooter and how that's been going viral and we've been focusing a lot about the shooter and his past and his pictures have been everywhere. Ryan Holiday would say, "Wow, we're this is a this is a psychopath dream, right? They get national media coverage and a ton of attention, which is just what they want." Yeah, I think he would notice that. Thanks, Olivia. What else? How might Ryan Holiday react, or what insights would he have on the Florida shooting? Do you think, or guess, or wonder? I think he would say that a lot of the um, news that is getting um, like published and covered now today is a lot about um, like gun laws and changing that as well and all the protests and stuff. So that's definitely like the second part of why you're seeing certain um, like lot like um, news published and internet because of like gun laws. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we have is we've tied the the massacre to the, uh, the most relevant political issue that uh, could be used to solve the problem, right? And we see a lot of urgency on that right now with the Florida students and their march that's planned. Um, so we're definitely seeing the conflation of the, uh, the tragedy with a political issue. And he would say, um, both sides are going to try to spin that to their uh, advantage. Advantage. Have you have you seen any examples of that? Thumbs up if you've seen an example of how that's been playing out in the last day or two. The link between the shooting and the pol and the and the legal issues around gun control. Well, there's also Trump has also made a tweet about how there's been so much focus on the Russian on the Russian involvement in the campaign and that if we were paying more attention, we would have been able to stop this guy. 
Oh yeah, sure. Because of his criticism of the FBI's uh, not responding when they got the phone call right. saying this guy is, you know, might, might be doing something. And so he has a, he has a political edge there to diminish the credibility of the FBI. Yes, you're right. That's another political <laughs> way in which this tragedy is being um, manipulated. Of course, for me as a grieving mother, who lost her 28 year old son last year uh, to a drug overdose. I can't think about the politics of this issue at all. I'm just, my head, my heart, and everything is just with the parents right now. I can't detach from, like we're riveted. Randy and I are just like, we're watching every night just for like the parents. We wanna, we wanna hear from the parents. Cause the parents uh, tragedy, the parents pain is kind of, connects to us in a really powerful way. Um, and I, I wonder, um, I wonder how uh, middle school kids and elementary school kids and high school kids are making sense of this. Do you guys have any kids in your life and have you been able to uh, like talk to them about how they're making sense of this school shooting? I don't know anyone personally, but I saw in the news last night that a lot of the school kids in Florida left class and started like, um, doing protests and saying they want safety and like it was a big commotion that's going around a lot now. Yeah. In fact, they're planning a march on Washington on March 20th and it's already in my calendar. Um, that's my birthday. Woohoo. Woohoo. That's a good day for a march. <laughs> yeah. The, the high school students in Florida seem pretty riled up right now. And uh, it's interesting to see how or whether they will be able to take on the, the challenging role of being activists. So in some ways, your insights on Ryan Holiday provide a really important frame for the rest of the semester. We're asking this question, what are some unexpected consequences of propaganda? And Ryan Holiday is helping us answer that question by thinking about how, um, how messages that have a, um, that have a um, specific uh, persuasive purpose, uh, can override people's um, critical thinking because, of course, of activating emotions and simplifying information. And that uh, the competition that's at the heart of uh, public relations can lead people to be cavalier with the truth, right? Um, so Ryan Holiday is going to probably be read for another 15 or 20 years uh, because of the insights that he had. He was, the word is prescient. He was prescient. He could predict this reality that the rest of us didn't see coming, right? When we were all feeling really enthusiastic about online media and he was warning us, be careful. This is going to go, this is going to have some, there's going to be some dangers here. Uh, so he's, he's a pretty cool guy in my book. Um, okay, so now I think we're ready. Uh, anybody else want to make any other comments about what you liked or hated about reading Ryan Holiday's part two? Well, sorry. Um, yeah, so something that I really liked was just um, normally the way that I get my news is through, I, I mentioned in another project, but like the Drudge Report. So it was actually like really interesting to um, read about how these headlines, you know, uh, can sometimes like make me rush to a conclusion. And um, I had a confirmation bias, like, and yeah, I think that it was just um, really useful to even read that anecdote about drugs um, and how I like, sometimes print, uh, you know, some stuff that just wasn't really confirmed. Yeah. I had the similar experience of reading about uh, Ryan Holiday's take on a guy I actually think is kind of a, a guy I really like, a journalist named Jeff Jarvis. I went to a conference this uh, last spring um, with Facebook on Facebook and the news and how Facebook was going to be changing its algorithms. And Jeff Jarvis was there and he was great. And then over and over in Ryan Holiday's book, it's like, Jeff Jarvis is a scumball. Jeff Jarvis is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So, you know, I mean, to his credit, the man knows how to get and hold your attention, right? You cannot put that book down, right? And so in some ways, he's using some of the very techniques that he's writing about, right? And so that's worth reflecting on as well, right? Okay, so let's talk about what's next. Um, one, one thing that I noticed was particularly hard for everybody, um, almost everybody, was finding examples of propaganda in entertainment. 
And I started reflecting on why is that hard for them? Why are, why are they struggling uh, to find those examples? Of course, some of you found really great examples, but a lot of you were clearly not, we're struggling with that. Um, and so I thought we could do an activity. This activity sets us up really nicely for your leap two project, right? Which we'll talk a little bit more about. But let's do this activity first, and then we'll um, and then we'll see if we can make a connection between what we're doing in the, this activity and what leap two asks you to do. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, watch a music video uh, that I'm pretty sure you haven't seen. Uh, and we're going to, as we watch it, we're going to ask these five critical questions. Uh, well, six, really, if we add up all the questions. The first question, who is the author and what is the purpose? The second question, what techniques are used to attract and hold attention? Question three, what lifestyles, values, and points of view are presented? Question four, how might different people interpret this message? Uh, question five, what context and additional information is needed to evaluate this message? Okay, so um, what I'd like you to do, well, actually I think since we're gonna watch as, a, we'll watch the video as a whole group, and then we'll break into two teams to have a discussion about these five questions and then we'll come back as a whole group and we'll think about what might be some positive and negative consequences of propaganda in entertainment give me a thumbs up if you know what we're going to be doing now okay so i'm going to take you to the uh, mind over media website uh, as you know i created this website um, now three or four years ago and um, it has examples of propaganda from all over the world. And this one is a really fascinating one. Um, we're gonna watch it in YouTube so we can see it on the big screen. Um, yeah, let's watch it on YouTube and see it on the big screen. And you can turn your sound up if you want. When I, when I make the screen big, can you actually see it? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go back to the big screen. I had that, I had two sound tracks going. It was really screwing me up. So we're going to go back to, yeah, all right. Is this a three-minute pop song? Yeah, I did that, you know. 
Okay, so the only thing that I probably want to tell you is that that video is from a pop star in Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm gonna break you up into two teams. You're gonna go back to those five critical questions and see which of those questions can you discuss, talk over, and make some educated guesses about. Thumbs up if you understand what we're doing now. Okay, so breakout room time. All right, there you go. So you're gonna get a note there saying to click on the breakout room. We're just gonna do this for about five minutes. So we'll see you back in the big room in five minutes. Right, is that what she said? Pop star? Yeah. Yes. In Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> um, wait, any final questions, I guess? <clears throat> Did you just say like the purpose is to be like anti Trump? Um, I think it's, yeah, anti Trump and then, but also, so women just, Earn the right to drive mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia, and um, I think it's kind of like I don't know, I don't know like who their like what their government is at all, but I think it's anti. Their government are trying to promote more change in their mm -hmm. government because like they're still dressed in conservative outfits, but there's like some spunk and personal style to it, so they're trying to be um, conservative but adding their own flair. Um, and like the, their chauffeur was female too. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. And then what was that basketball um, part about? Like when they were playing basketball in the... I, I think it was just to like prove that women can do sports too. That like, yeah. it's not just guys that can have fun on the basketball court or can like skateboard and stuff. Yeah. I actually didn't really get the Trump reference at all has he like made comments about their country like saying like you guys suck because like none of your women don't you know what i mean like has he yeah. like, make himself look better about them like it kind of seems like that and they're kind of like f you trump like look at our women like they're allowed to do all of this now you know what i mean yeah yeah i'm i really have no idea i don't know i also think it was it a big be. thing how, when they did show him he was in the back of the car like in the all the way in the back in the yeah like not in the yeah. front. Um, and then what would you say, what techniques are used to hold and attract attention? Just like dancing? Yeah. Music, like lights? Costume. Yeah. Well, their outfits. Yeah, their outfits. Um, like them doing abnormal, like things that like wouldn't be okay, I guess, mm -hmm. in their society to do. like bowling that was the thing were they at a carnival it kind of looked like they might have been at a carnival yeah yeah there was a lot of stuff going on I, um what about how my people how my different people interpret this message like i guess it kind of is it's like depending on like how much you know about the situation in a way yeah. you know what i mean because somebody who knows all about trump and saudi arabia's relationship would obviously know more than we do <laughs> what was the question how like, might different people interpret this message? Um, Based on like their background information, I get well, yeah. that's yeah. It. And maybe if you're a man or a woman. Yeah, if you're like a Saudi man who, who hasn't agreed with this law, I guess it would be like, um, uh, this would be, I guess it would be considered bad propaganda. Mm -hmm. Like blasphemous. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. And then what context and additional information is needed to evaluate this message? Maybe like, like what they were I didn't know what she was saying, like 
that's the beginning yeah of the I, yeah exactly like so what are they saying in the music it. video and the politics behind it yeah and yeah the trump reference mm-hmm. i don't think any yeah. of us got that one Bye. all right that's it and i guess you would have to know that um it just became legal for saudi women to drive cars yeah yeah yeah, I feel like there was a lot of stuff that, like, they showed in it. I just wasn't aware of it, so I, like, don't know, like, what it stands for. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I guess maybe the culture, too, to because they aren't known for, they're known for wearing those all black. Garments. Yeah. I don't know what they're called. I don't think, burkas, I don't know what they're called. That, like, that sounds right. I think burkas have the mesh, but I don't know what they have. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I feel like that's like it. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Did, um, did, uh, did you, what did you notice about how the men were depicted in this video? Oh, um, well, the, there were the kind of- two men driving the car that the Trump person was in seemed to be stern and severe. And then there was one shot actually that like the camera's at the bottom and the man seemed to be looking down and like shaking, I think he was shaking his finger or something. Like wearing a pair of Ray-Bans. They were like behind a plane or something. Like they were totally dressed like differently. I feel like then like they were more free to like wear whatever they wanted to wear than the, the woman in the um, video. Maybe like when some men, men are divided, they're still divided on the on the topic. Yeah. So we saw men wearing traditional clothes, and then we saw men wearing quite way out there expensive designer clothes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. So you guys now, I guess maybe you should spend maybe one or two minutes uh, seeing if you can think about based on this analysis, uh, what back to the purpose of this the author's purpose. Um, what was the main author's purpose? If you had to guess. Um, promoting women. Promoting the change, social change. Could it have, could it have kind of been about like making women like their country more? And like the, it was kind of, I don't know if this is right, but I kind of interpreted it as like them showing Trump. That I was like clothed. (laughs) (laughs) Hello. (laughs) I don't get this format. It freaks me out. I'm being honest. Video. We we kind of wish there were subtitles for that video. Oh yeah. Wouldn't it have been nice to know what the language was? We have no idea what they were saying. Right. Yeah. But you got some messages just from the music and the images, yeah. right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Okay, we'll wait till the other team comes back and then we'll sort of share our insights. And look, there they are. Wonderful. Um, okay, so we didn't have the words. We don't, we're not familiar with this musical artist, right? So we don't know his reputation, his fame, right? We, oh, we, wait, that was a man? Yeah, the, the, the artist, the art, oh. artist who made the song is a, is a man. Yep. We don't know, we don't know how, we don't know the context, right? None of us are Saudi, right? Mm-hmm. But we still can make some interpretations. So what key ideas came out in your conversation that were most interesting to you? We were a little confused about the Trump usage in that. Like we, we understand that his presence was there, but um, really didn't understand exactly what they were trying to say so I think I think I think that you know with Trump like and this was just kind of like what I I was inferring I mean like this has a lot to do with and if you even look at like um, the the ideas that are sort of embodied that are very hateful towards like Muslim culture um, with a lot of like people thinking that like they're they're somehow like violent or separate or different and all of the activities that they were doing even like the colors that they were wearing you know were very similar to like what we see over here and it was also kind of punching at the idea that like if you're a Muslim like you're you're a misogynist 
you know, so like women were driving and it, with Saudi Arabia where women recently started to be, yeah, so, so that was an element um, of it. So I definitely saw like some of the political undertones, I, I think, or I'm totally off base. <laughs> Other insights that came from your from your or, or questions that got raised or ideas that you discovered as you started to analyze. So Saudi has a prince that I remember. They, it's a prince that just declared this law that women can drive, and so I was wondering why they decided to not incorporate their government in it. Like they didn't show his picture or like any anything like that and but they decided to show trump yeah good okay. point that's a good thing to ask what else did you notice so what so what was the what was the uh author's purpose the musician's purpose we know his target audience was saudi and maybe we could say arabic pop pe people who like pop music Right? So that's his target audience. What message is he sending with this piece of entertainment? Mm, change like, is good. Yeah. Girls have like, girls are having more like, like they can do the same thing as guys, I guess. <clears throat> good. What else? I was confused about the, I, like not confused, but what I noticed was like the use of colors that the women's were wearing like they all had bright colors on like converse like all like these bright colorful like transportation modes that they were using so i didn't really know i kind of interpreted like they're trying to stand out and like show that they are there looks like they're going to a carnival ah, nicely put are they are there are the bright colors designed to say we're here maybe mm. maybe yeah. yeah how might different people interpret this message differently if you were guessing. Um, I think some people might just see it as like kind of fun, like mm -hmm. low key, like nothing serious, but then other people might see it as like a kind of like a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not like a revolt, but like kind of going against norms. Revolution. Yeah, revolution, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I think, Sorry, um, I, I definitely think that often, like what I've studied um, about the Muslim religion, like I, I studied under somebody who was, she considered herself to be like a feminist Muslim. So it was really interesting. So I think her interpretation um, would probably just be, you know, that you can wear a hijab and you can, you know, um, be part of the Muslim faith and still take uh, I'm sorry, I'm exhausted. Take control of your womanhood, if you will. Sure. That, that makes a lot of sense, that that would be the message. So um, in order for me to understand this message, I actually have to go do some research, right? And that's really true for all the propaganda that we get exposed to, right? So I just typed in collages by Majid Alesa. That's the, the, the name I saw at the top of the music of the of the youtube right and i can see i can see the lyrics they have you know just like we do right you can get the lyrics <laughs> in english translation that'd be cool okay so what are those lyrics oh my god check it out may men disappear may men disappear they give us psychological illnesses none of them are sane and none of them are sane each of them has an illness isn't this a guy though? Yeah. Yeah. So guys writing about his own people, like his own. Like yeah. So who people. is this guy, Majid Alesa? Uh, he's from Saudi Arabia. Um, it, I want to see a photo of him, but we're not getting it there, right? Um, but um, I learned when I Googled around um, this has caused quite a controversy a viral pop video featuring Saudi women in Islamic veils on skateboards has caused a storm in the wealthy Gulf state. Huajas, which roughly translates as concerns in English, is the latest song from Saudi producer Majid Alesa and has been branded disgusting, right? 
So a lot of really interesting. Notice itself, the track is a reworking of a traditional folk song. See, that's something we couldn't have understood right? That this would have been perceived as a very traditional song made into a pop song, right? And clearly works irony into the song, right? Um, so lots of interesting things, including a piece in the New York Times, right? So lots of social media conversation about this um, post, right? Um, of course, what's really complicated, what's really complicated is that um, I can only see, I can only read the English language internet about this. And I would bet that the Arabic uh, dialogue about this would be even more interesting. So I'm always aware of the limitations of my knowledge, right? And that's why when I interpret media messages, I'm, I try to be reflective about like, I don't have a full understanding of this, and I have to be provisional in my interpretations. But I'm driven by intellectual curiosity to want to try to understand what it might mean, um, because of course, I'm really fascinated at the blending of traditional and contemporary culture. Mm -hmm. right? So for me, I think it's a cool song, because I mean, that that uh, the scene that happens in the, like it's a nightclub scene, right? The nightclub scene, that music is really cool, mm -hmm. right? And I love that idea that we, we Westerners can get a lot of entertainment value from musical works that blend traditional and pop culture. Um, that being said, it is worth now turning to the question we really wanna talk about, and we only have about five minutes to do it. Um, and here it is. So like what might be some positive and negative consequences of this propaganda in entertainment? This pop song, what might some positive and negative consequences of it be? I think a positive one would be that women might feel more empowered to like stand out and do things differently. That could be possible, but it could also be negative too, because if they try to, you know, do something different, they could get punished for it. Yeah, it's possible that a teenage girl who watched this video would get a great idea to go skateboarding and then get arrested. Mm -hmm. right? So um it, there are some real negative consequences that could be a part of this uh propaganda well i wanted to make sure that you were able to recognize how propaganda works in music in film in movies in um in all the six locations that it found it's found and looking for examples in and film tv shows and entertainment is really really interesting okay so now that brings us to a look at what's up for what's up for um, next week. First, let's talk a little bit about Leap Two, right? I introduced Leap Two to you last week, and you guys know that it's due on Wednesday, March seventh. I'm just going to ask you if you have any questions about this assignment. Not yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one thing I would do if I were you is I would take a look at the really interesting examples of students who've done well in the class and what they made. Let's take a look at um, Nikki. This two minute short animated film was the first of a series of shorts released by Chipotle, a popular fast chain of restaurants specializing in tacos and burritos, aimed at promoting a whole food lifestyle over industrial farming. The short, titled Back to the Start, directed by Johnny Kelly, was released in 2013 and features the vocals of music legend Willie Nelson covering the popular tune, The Scientist. Okay, so right away you recognize that this is a screencast, right? Nikita has made a video where she's playing a YouTube video and she's reading a script over top of it, right? And did you notice how much information she gave us in the first uh, 30 seconds? Right? So basically, uh, your critical analysis is a screencast, 
right? It's a screencast and you need to share that uh, and record that and upload it to your YouTube account. As we said last week in the, in the uh, video, in the, in the live chat, this is not the kind of project that you can do in a day because there are so many stages involved. And you can see here that I outline those stages, right? Your biggest challenge is to select an example of propaganda, right? If it's not on the Mind Over Media blog, you can upload it to the blog, right? So use any form of propaganda you want. Uh, contemporary propaganda, not historical, contemporary propaganda. And create a screencast video no more than five minutes in length where you critically analyze the propaganda by answering the questions. Gain knowledge by doing some research, just like we did with the Hwajas video, right? To learn about the, oh my goodness, this, this Saudi Arabian music video is really controversial. Write a script. And there's some sources there to help you on how to write a script for a vlog or a screencast. There's a tutorial on how to make a screencast with the free online tool, Screencast-O-Matic. Record your video, right? And uh, some details about how to do that. Share your screencast, embed it on your Leap to page. And that's how I'm gonna grade it. This is a big project. It's actually a lot of fun. It's a creative production project, um, but it's, um, it's a chunk of work. What questions do you have? We're going to post this on our blog, right? Correct. Oh, okay. Yep. And notice here, on your blog, Leap 2 page, compose a headline and subhead with some key ideas, right? Under 100 words, sh very short and then you embed your screencast video on that page. You have to make a works cited list of the sources that you used to create, this, uh, uh, to create this screencast. So the websites you visited, the information that you used to build your analysis, right? So that'll, that will go on your web page, right? So you might, look, you might look at some of the other ones. Let's see if you have any other questions. Okay, so when's the due date for that? March 7th. There you go. So, uh, yeah, so you have a little bit of time, but not too much time. Let's take a look at what's next for um, next week, and um, then we'll be done. So next week, our topic is public interest propaganda. So we're finally getting to really dig down into the idea that propaganda can be beneficial. Of course, that was our big surprise at the beginning of the semester, wasn't it? Like, oh my God, propaganda can be beneficial? Yes, indeed, right? And so we're going to take a close look at it. We're gonna watch this really powerful film by Werner Herzog. Werner Herzog was the, um, taught, was, uh, let's just watch the first 30 seconds to get your imagination. So Werner Herzog is Time Magazine says he's one of the 100 most important uh, people alive today. <laughs> this guy is a famous German director. He's won bazillions of prizes. The film is 30 minutes long. It's pretty amazing. After you watch the film, I'd like you to read the short article uh, by Ian Kraus, Crouch, um, which is about the campaign that this is part of. And then down here, uh, see if, share one thing that you learned. So you click there and you use this space, just identify one thing you learned about this campaign because you're gonna experience the movie and then you're gonna read about the campaign, right? That's kind of a good thing. Okay, so after you do that, then uh, the big reading for the week, this is worth 10 points, um, is you're gonna work with a group of five students to read and annotate this article. Give me a thumbs up if you've ever used a digital annotation tool before. Whoa, really? Oh my God, you guys are seniors? Okay, well, so there's a first time for everything. Here's how it works. So each team is going to annotate one article. We're really all reading the same thing, but we're gonna annotate it individually. 
Each student needs to read the article and then compose three annotations. First, a summary of a section of the article. Second, a comment on a small section of highlighted text that you highlight. And then third, some questions or ideas that occur to you as you read. Be sure to read the annotations of other students in your team and don't duplicate their work, right? That's not good. So we're reading a kind of classic chapter by Garth Jowett and Victoria O'Donnell called How to Analyze Propaganda uh, in a book called Propaganda and Persuasion in its fifth edition. So let's just see, there's the teams. You, you find your name. Okay, where is your name? You click on the link, right? The link takes you to a tool called Cami. It's a Chrome extension. If you don't have an account, like you can see, I went right to it because I have an account. When you click on it, it's gonna say, would you like to use Cami? And you're gonna say yes. And it's gonna say, give me your Gmail. And you're gonna say, okay, and you're gonna get to this, right? So Cami is really cool because what it does is it lets me highlight text. Ooh, isn't that cool? See, I use a little highlighting tool over here. It lets me comment on texts, like here I can make a comment. Uh, it also lets me uh, draw on the text. And if I, if I think that might affect readability, and <laughs> you guys might be mad at me, right? It, then you can erase it by using the, uh, let's see now, how do I do the erase button? There's an erase button here somewhere. Uh, where's the erase button? Oh yeah, there's my erase button, right? I think I can undo it pretty easily too. There you go. Um, so basically you're gonna read this article. This article says there are 10 questions to ask when you're analyzing propaganda and it walks you through it. It's a pretty serious article, so I want you to read it really carefully, right? And what's really cool is you can add a text box so you can play around with the tools, right? There's a lot of interesting, you can insert an image, you can uh, even make a, an audio comment. So basically three comments. What questions do you have about the, um, about the annotation activity? So are the other people on our team gonna see our markups? Yes. Okay, so where are we putting the annotation for that? On, under the pathwork, or are we just taking notes on that? Or nope. So you're gonna be you're gonna be annotating this article, and just like you saw my annotations show up, yours are gonna show up in the margins. You okay, and so, five yeah. friends, right? Okay. So all you have to do is annotate this article, and what's gonna happen if you do this thoughtfully is that you'll develop a conversation. The first reader will go in and make some points. The second reader, as they read, will make some other points and maybe respond to some of your points, right? So it actually ends up being a really cool way to engage in a collaborative reading activity. Um, and it also helps you notice how different of you are gonna get different things out of this article, right? Some of you are gonna be really whacked out by one message and another one of you isn't gonna even care about that. You'll find something else that's really interesting to you, right? But it is a pretty serious 20 page article. So uh, that's partly why we're reading it so carefully. This article will help you get an A too, right? That's why I'm having you read it. Um, okay, so that's a big project. Next, next project, and I'm gonna be really quick now because I see it's five o'clock and I'm, I'm gonna let you go. Um, I want you to read a short article by Helene Jaffe and that article I'd like you to tweet about. So let me show you where that is. Ah, we're at public interest propaganda. Um, Helene Jaffe, this is a short article. It's like seven or eight pages long. It's called The Power of Visual Material persuasion, emotion, and identification. It's a classic article in the field of uh, propaganda. Read and tweet a key idea that you learned from this reading using the COM416 hashtag. Great. Okay, now there's a quiz. Oh boy, 50 points. It's going to be open for two days until Friday at midnight. Okay, so there's the questions. 
Describe a case where Ryan, one of Ryan Holiday's tricks had unintended consequences. What's page view compensation and how does it affect the viral spread of misinformation and propaganda? According to Ryan Holiday, which emotion drives people to share or spread propaganda the most? What is snark and why is it commonly used? And Holiday offers strate strategies for managing as a media consumer to, to describe two pieces of practical advice he offers to readers. Like everything in this class, this is an open book, open note test, but it's going to close Friday, February 23rd at midnight, right? So put that on your immediate to-do list. I am expecting that you have read part two of Ryan Holiday, so that's obviously what it's about. Um, and then we'll meet next, oh, that's not Tuesday. Let me fix that. We'll meet next Wednesday for our synchronous class, unless when everybody um, fills in the doodle poll, there's one clear favorite. And then I might send you an email, look in your email. If I send you an email, we'll change the date. Okay, whoa, that was a fast hour, a crazy hour, but Kind of fun and so glad that Kelsey, Jordan, Monica, Peyton, Olivia, and Matt, that you all showed up. It really makes me happy um, because uh, your interaction actually inspires other people who aren't in, the aren't in the live class, but who are still trying to learn along with us. All right, so let's wave goodbye, and I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.